1981, uh, I was preaching at a Holy Ghost revival service in uh, about 50 miles north of Montevideo, Minnesota. I was 28 years old, and uh, we had to have these services in this old barn. And the barn was so old that it said when it rained, we would feel it inside as well as out. <laughs> and uh, so we gathered together and we had a powerful Christian band from Rama Bible College. And uh, I was preaching that night and, and uh, we, uh, up in the barn, everybody sat on hay bales and it was just really special. About 50 or 60 people and when the worship started, that old barn started swaying like this. <laughs> and uh, we had to move it to the bottom level after that because it was going. <laughs> but I noticed three types of people there that night when I was preaching. That the ones that on the platform and brought worship and those that were close by the platform were on fire for God and wanted the most that they could get from the Holy Spirit, never feeling like they were completely full, needing more, wanting to overflow and, and to have more. Those of you that are baptized in the Holy Spirit, the evidence of speaking in tongues, you know what I mean. You always want more. <clears throat> then in the middle of the church were those that loved the Lord, but they're not sure about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but they're open to what God was wanted to do in their lives, and that was the middle group. <clears throat> and then in the back were the late-coming Pharisees and Sadducees who <laughs> stood like, I don't, know, I don't know how that's possible, but they stood like this during worship. So, and I knew that night that there would be nothing for them ever unless they repented and opened their heart to God. Amen. All right. So I guaranteed the three groups this. Those of you that are on fire, add more oil so you can be more on fire. Amen. My cup runneth over, Lord. For those of you that are seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit, don't water it down to be something else. And for those of you that are Pharisees and Sadducees and don't believe a word I'm saying, you'll go home the same and nothing will change. Well, last year, a year ago, last year, my birthday, January 20th, you might want to write that down. <laughs> I was given a, a watch, an eye watch, and you know, it, it's, it's really special. One of the things about the iWatch, it tells me the time, the date. It also tells me the temperature. But then it tells me my heart rate. Right now I'm 99 beats per, you know, you're getting, you're getting me up a little bit, so. And then it does an EKG for AFib. I can do an EKG immediately from my smartphone, I watch. Isn't that nice? One day I was so excited I felt like I needed it, so I did an EKG and says, you got AFib going on, call if you feel any worse. Okay, you can do that. Well, last year, in November, after the fall of our country, I went and... That's right. Sorry. No, that's right. I, I went that's and true. visited my mom. My mom's 96. And in the whole town, that this one day I had to go to the bathroom really bad. So I saw McDonald's, but everything's closed, everything's masked up. And 
and everything shut down, but something had to give. <laughs> so I was trying to go into the, in the bathroom at McDonald's, and I tripped and fell so hard, my phone said, you have taken a big fall, are you okay? <laughs> and I'm going to dial 911 in 10, 9, 8, and, and alarms went off at uh, 7, and I thought, better tell no. <laughs> so I'm laying there, and, and I'm an old man, I'm 68, not as old as Pastor John, but I'm older. <laughs> and I was laying there, and I thought, if I'm in serious shape, my phone's dialing 911. That's pretty good. Kind of nice, right? Yeah. Tell you something else about my iPhone, uh, iWatch. When I put it on, do you think it made me a better person? <laughs> didn't change my Christianity, didn't change my walk, didn't change my temperament, didn't change, didn't make me a better person. But did it make me better equipped? When we have the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the evidence of speaking in tongues, we have our eye watch on. We're better equipped. You know, there's actually ten things that you're saying when you're speaking in tongues. Declaring the wonders of God. Praying the Spirit according to the will of God. Jude 20 says we... Uh, praying in the Holy Spirit to build our faith. There are a lot of reasons why we speak in tongues. And just like the I watch, I'm better equipped by having it. But one thing that I find that's hurting Pentecost and the messages that are out there is so, and, and this is happening a lot. People are very angry about not having it because people that do have it insist that it's a great thing. So they say, well, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not a company with speaking in tongues. It's a company with another, any one of the gifts. Okay, there are 30 gifts. Which one did you get when you were baptized in the Holy Spirit? Well, it says, if you prophesy. I said, fine. Did you prophesy? No. What did you do? Well, nothing. Nothing happened. I said, okay. okay. Imagine this. Jesus calls you to the upper room to wait until you've been clothed with power from on high. Luke 24, verse 49. So you're in there on day five and six. You're getting kind of tired of waiting around, and you've been in this conference in the upper room long enough, and you say, it's like, hey, Thomas, what do you think? We've been here five days. Do we have it yet? Thomas says, I don't know. Peter, what do you think? Do we have it yet? Uh, it's day six, maybe. Good enough. Okay, you, you guys feel good enough? Good enough. I, I'm baptized in the Holy Spirit. I'm good enough. Day nine comes. John, what do you think's happening? We might. Jesus says, stay here until we've been clothed with power on high. When day came, 10 came, and Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 4 came, and they all began to speak in tongues and prophesy and tongues of fire on their head, all these things. You know why they knew when to leave? Because they've been clothed with power from on high. Amen. And when you're clothed, you know you're clothed. Amen. So many people are watering this thing down because they think they got it when they've been clothed with nothing. Nothing. And when they think of that waiting for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it's waiting for three minutes at the altar, and oh, nothing happened when they waited for ten days. 
how bad, how much do we need the fullness of the Holy Spirit in our life? Do we actually believe that we love it, want it enough and need it enough to seek him enough to have him show up to give us the power that we need? For a lot of Christians, the answer is, it's optional equipment. I can live without it, with it or without it. Yeah, my option, my watch is optional equipment. As a matter of fact, uh, if Pastor John gives me a Rolex, I'll be upgrading. But <laughs> other than that, I put this on. Why? Because it does some things. I was baptized in the Holy Spirit two days after I was saved. April, 4, April 2nd, 1968, when John was having his 16th birthday party, I was saved that day at the age of 15. Two days later, three women came to the Bible study that I was at, and they said, you're ready. And I said, ready for what? They said, you're ready for the Holy Spirit. I had no clue except for Presbyterian Church, glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost. Uh, other than that, I didn't have a clue. So lift your hands to the Lord. <clears throat> I began to lift my hands to the Lord. And it said, open your mouth, God, God will fill it. Open your mouth, God will fill it. So I opened my mouth. I began to speak in tongues. And my mind said, these weird women, they're in such a, they're in a cult here, <laughs> speaking Greek, Hebrew, or something. I, I'm speaking in tongues, mind you. And my brain is saying all this stuff. So after that, uh, then that was about a two-hour Holy Ghost experience in the afternoon. Uh, and they said, we want you to come with us tonight and go witnessing. So I said, came home to my mom, and I'm 15 years old, you know. I said to my mom, the women want me to go sewing with them. And my mom said, I said, that's what they said, they want me to come sewing. And she says, okay, whatever, go. <laughs> and so I get there, and I misunderstand so winning for sewing. Well, that night, I was so filled with the power of the Spirit, we witnessed to 20 people at Knott's Berry Farm and during the days before it was free access and we went as to midnight and I get home and that was a powerful Pentecostal day for me. Thank God. Hallelujah. Somebody could say speaking in tongues is of the devil. Well too late I already have it. Right. Yeah. Right. I could tell you story after story of the wonderful things that God has done over the last 53 years. And you can ask me how long did this sermon take me to, to prepare? Some of it, 53 years. <laughs> and I was in a lot of word, to, a lot of preparation, a lot of study. And the Lord said, I want you to set that aside for now. And then two days later, I got a rhema anointing, if you can understand that, that said, this is the prophetic emphasis you're ready to preach. <laughs> we wait for that. I never want to come into the pulpit just bringing you something that I've worked on this last week hoping to be good. Joseph Parker, one of the great preachers of the 1870s, was, his church was down the street from another famous preacher, Charles Spurgeon. 
and they were down the street from another great preacher named Alexander McLaren. Within a few mile space, three of the greatest preachers to ever, ever dress a pulpit. Joseph Parker delivered a message and his church was as big as Spurgeon's at the time. And after the words, a woman came and said, that was one of the greatest sermons I ever heard. And she, 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 he said, yeah, I have to agree. She says, well, that sounds a little arrogant. He says, you don't understand. I was upstairs crying out to God, waiting for God to give me a word. And I say, simply became his prophet this morning and delivered what he said. Amen. One thing about being an old man, you get more emotional as the years go by. <laughs> but let's turn to Acts chapter 19, verse 1. Have you heard? Have you heard? How many love the word of God? Amen. Amen. I always like the next question. How many love it enough to read it? Amen. You know, it's just not perusing the word of God that's good for us. We need to find a rhema of God so that God can speak to us his word from the pages that we're reading. That comes through an investment. Because you could read the genealogies in First Chronicles chapter 1 through 10 and then all of a sudden in the middle of that there's one verse that speaks a rhema to your heart and changes you for the day and you're ready to go. Chapter 19 says, While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived in Ephesus. There he found some disciples. What are they? Disciples, right? Discipleship and salvation have been watered down so much and separated as being two different things. But I want to share with you some things on the word disciple. The word disciple is only used two times in the Septuagint and the Old Testament. But it's used 282 times in the New Testament, in the Gospels, in the Book of Acts, just those five books. But it is never used in Paul's epistles or the general letters, or the book of Revelation. Jesus said a lot of hard things about being a disciple. In Luke chapter 14, 33, Jesus said, In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Wow, that's a big thing. I'm a Christian, but I don't know if I'm that. But Acts chapter 11, verse 26 says, The disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. Matthew, through Acts, the word disciple 282 times. Now it's the word Christian in the, in the epistles. I totally believe that a disciple and Christian is the same thing. I think it's watered down by people saying, well, you don't really need to have, repent, whatever. Just turn to Jesus, give him your heart, and that's good. Reminds me of another story. There was this guy in Big Bear who found himself... 10 to 15 pounds of overweight and pants a little tight and shirt a little tight. 
but he was enjoying every day at OJ's Donuts. <laughs> and pretty soon one donut turned into two, turned into three, turned into who cares? So some weight started coming. And then he looked in the mirror and said, you know what, I need to make a life change. Things, something has changed in my life. And I need to do some things. And I need to repent and make a change and walk towards God and do something different. So a few weeks went by and at his church, he had heard an altar call by saying, hey, listen, God loves you just the way you are. You don't need to change a thing. Just buy bigger clothes and brand new wardrobe and you're good to go. <laughs> so without life change, this individual gets from X large to double X and next size pants and all new clothes and somebody says you're looking good yeah I'm, I'm doing great he knows that there's no life change only just bought the next set of clothes so many people are buying salvation like that where the word of God says repent which repent means to turn away from your life and then turn to God you don't repent and turn to nothing. You return, repent from your life and you turn to God in the second part of repentance. And if you truly do that, you're going to find the miraculous thing by saying you, you're a disciple because you're not going to want to say, Jesus, I gave you my heart, but I, I'm not going to give you my life. I mean, if you're genuinely born again, you say, Jesus, I give you my life entirely. The pearl of great price has two interpretations. The pearl being the church and people of God Jesus died for. Jesus gave everything for that pearl. But on the other hand, is that it is you giving everything to buy the pearl who is Jesus Christ. So when somebody says, where are you with the Lord? If you if Today, if you say, you know what? I'm not a disciple or follower of Jesus, but I'm God saved and I have Jesus in my heart, but I'm not that. You might want to revisit that and give your heart to the Lord in rededication. Is that okay? But those of you that are on fire for the Lord, he's got everything. He means everything. I, I love the Lord. In the early church, there was a, in northern Africa, by, there was a young girl, 13, 14, that got saved with some of her friends. And the, this is about 65, age 70 A.D., and uh, two weeks of their salvation, some of their friends told the local council that these girls were worshiping a different god. So they had to appear, appear before the council, and the Roman government said, you can worship Jesus, you can worship your god, but all you have to do is worship the emperor too. Worship the emperor. They were saved two weeks and didn't know anything. But they knew that their life belonged to Jesus and they said, we can't do that. And Rome took them to the local arena and they were uh, killed by lions. Gladly giving their lives. Why? Because Jesus was their life. So then he found, Paul found some disciples and asked them, 
Have you heard? Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now, the premier theologian of the New Testament, the author of Romans, 1 and 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, Titus, and Philemon. He's got quite a thing going, right? He's the premier theologian, and he knows that when you get saved, you have the Holy Spirit. He knows that. He told, as a matter of fact, he told you that. So he, he must be asking them something else, right? He's not asking them, well, you're saved. No, they are, he found them to be disciples. He's asking them, he's not asking them, do you have the Holy Spirit since you believed as if they didn't have it when they believed? He's asking something else, right? You see that? Are we Pentecostal or what? Yes. yes. All right. Let me know you're here. If some of you need my watch, you can borrow it. <laughs> Paul questions them to see if they receive the Holy Spirit because Every Holy Spirit experience in the book of Acts, every single one, points to Acts chapter 2. Everyone. So when Paul says, did you, did you receive the Holy Spirit? Paul's singing in Acts chapter 2. When Peter is talking about Cornelius' house in Acts chapter 10 and 11 and talks about the Holy Spirit coming upon them, he's talking about Acts chapter 2. When Philip's preaching the good news in Acts chapter 8, and Peter and John go to lay their hands on him and pray for the Holy Spirit to fill them, they're talking about Acts chapter 2. Right. Amen. So when you're talking about the being filled with the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you're talking about the Acts chapter 2 experience. And if you're not talking about that, call it something else because the Word of God calls it the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Now, what, hurt, what hurts people's feelings about this? Because it's very controversial. Everybody wants to know and feel like they've been baptized in the Holy Spirit and not be left out, right? So if I don't speak in tongues, you're saying I'm not baptized in the Holy Spirit. That hurts my feelings. But don't let it hurt your feelings. Seek for your own eye watch. Get equipped. Get something from God. Be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Get what Jesus gave. Mm -hmm. So, this uh, time in Ephesus is Paul's most difficult time. But just a few verses earlier in Acts chapter 18, there was a young fiery preacher named Apollos from Ephesus who was also a disciple who just heard of John's baptism, and he was ready for an upgrade. And it says in that passage that Priscilla and Aquila gave him an upgrade, and he would get, went out preaching more fervently, more on, power, more on fire. The most passionate preacher, maybe in the New Testament time, needed an upgrade, right? That's just... Last part of chapter 18. So if you're a disciple, you will be open to the next level. No matter what you have. No matter where you're at. I'm baptized in the Holy Spirit. I speak in tongues. I've been doing that for 53 years. I'm ready for the next level. I will never say, hey, I'm good, I'm good, I'm, I'm good, I, I got what I need, I'm good. 
No, I need more. I want more. If I think I'm filled, I want it to overflowing. If I think I'm good and I'm filled with the Holy Spirit and my cup is full, get a bigger cup. You know, I, I work with several bishops that I'm responsible for in Kenya. And one of my bishops is Bishop Helam, and we've been working with Bishop Helam for 23 years. As a matter of fact, when Trish and I first met Helam, he was a young elder in his church, just loved God. But now he's a powerful bishop, and we've sold over 100 churches in the ministry with him. And when I check on the pastors, he likes to tell if they're on fire for not. He says, what about Pastor Jeremiah? How's he doing? Oh, on fire, on fire for the Lord. What about uh, Pastor Peter? Have you seen him for a while? He's a flat tire man. <laughs> and I know when Helam says, the pastor's a flat tire, it means that he's let the fire go. He's let things go to the side, got comfortable doing something else. I have said this for years, I still say it, I could take anyone from salvation to ordination if this stick with me for the time. Well, I had three people that in Big Bear that have wanted that, and when it came down to the tough questions, they bailed. One, I said, uh, we're learning how to preach, and I said, that's really good. I said, but tell me this. Tell me about your devotion life and time with the Lord. He said, why are you asking me that? I said, well, I'm training you in ministry. I can ask you anything I want. <laughs> what did you have for breakfast? <laughs> well, I'm asking you the most essential question. What's your time with the Lord look like? Did you have a relationship with God in meditation and prayer and devotions? He says, I've never heard of that. I said, well, we're not doing any more ministry training and because Jesus called the 12 disciples, first of all, to be with him. Do you know that? When he called the 12 disciples, he didn't call them, he didn't say, well, I got a Pentecostal prospect here and I want Matthew in here to do the books. And No, he called the 12 to be with him. Amen. So to be with Jesus. So this person got offended and quit. And I had another person looking for ministry and things. And, and I said, tell me about your devotional life. How much time you spend in prayer. Well, Pastor Mike, that's none of your business. I thought, wow, did he talk to this other guy? I mean, what's going on? <laughs> I said, we're done until you get in touch with Jesus because no one is going to preach the word of God in my house unless they've heard it from Jesus Christ first Amen. through his word. Verse 2. Uh, so they answered, We've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul's talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, talking Acts chapter 2. These 12 said, Listen, we haven't even heard about this. And then Paul changes the subject. He says, well, what baptism did you hear about? And they said, John's baptism. 
The very thing, same thing that Apollo said in Acts chapter 18, you only knew the John's baptism. Not too bad. Repent and turn to God, preparing the way for Jesus. But these boys needed an upgrade. So Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. I want to say this, that you cannot get saved unless you repent. No. Well, I thought it's by grace alone and faith alone. Absolutely, God will give you the faith and the grace to repent. And turn from your wicked ways, Second Chronicles 7, 14, and turn to God and let him transform your life. And unless we preach that message and see the repentance in our message, all then we're talking to them about is, you don't need life change, you just need bigger clothes. You just need to look good. Some people, you understand, just never get it, right? And it's not an intellectual thing, it's a spiritual thing. Because the word says that Satan has blinded the eyes of of the unbeliever. And unless that revelation comes, they cannot get saved. There's people in our churches, I hope nobody here, but who don't get it at all and never come to repentance and then leave and you find out, I wonder if that person ever really got saved. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is Jesus. On hearing this, they they said, "We're, we're good. We don't need an upgrade. Is that what they said? No. On hearing this, they opened up their faith, they opened up their heart, they opened up their life and said, On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Well, Apollos, for some reason, doesn't say that that happened. I don't know. But in this group of guys, 12 guys, need to identify with Jesus, death, burial, and resurrection, Romans chapter 6, 1 through 4. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke in glossa, tongues. Wow, it's amazing. I I had that happen to me a couple times. Years ago, I was baptizing. And there's two terms I'm going to share with you. Glossolalia which means speaking in an unknown language to yourself and speaking in an utterance that is not intelligible. Glossolalia. Then there's xenoglossia, which means you're speaking in a language, in tongues, and somebody's hearing in their own language. That's right. Okay. And that happened for 15 languages in Acts chapter 2. We were baptizing a young man who was from Lebanon. And he had brought his brothers and family to witness the baptism. And he was going to get him baptized. Well, just ahead of him came another guy to be baptized. And this is kind of funny. We, this guy came off the street, got saved, and now he's in the water. So we brought, brought him to the waters of baptism. He went down, came out speaking in tongues, except for his fluent Arabic and freaking the four brothers out in the, 
in the in the sanctuary, screaming and crying, and and nobody was going out. And we asked the next gentleman who was to be baptized, "What is this? What did he say?" He says he's declaring praise and worship to Jesus in Arabic. Oh my! Santa Glossia. Glossolalia. These things are real. A friend of mine was preaching in Mombasa and uh, during the service afterwards this young, this old, old man came to the altar with an interpreter and began to pray for him to, for the baptism of the Holy Spirit and he speaks in perfect English Thank you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. And my friend, it was no big deal to my friend because he speaks English. Brother. But everybody started freaking out and crying. And so he said, what happened to the interpreter? The interpreter says, well, he doesn't speak English. <laughs> what does he speak? Does he speak Swahili? No, he's too old for that. What does he speak? He speaks his mother tongue. That's it? That's it. Wow, they were witnessing a demonstration that was really miraculous. Yeah. Laid hands on them. The Holy Spirit came upon them. They began to speak in Gosla. And they prophesied, and there were about 12 men in all. How many got baptized in the Holy Spirit, speaking tongues, prophesied? 12, not 11, not 10. There wasn't three of them that say, didn't say, well, you know, I, I didn't get it. I'm not getting it. No, they all... And you know what the Greek word for all means? All. all. <laughs> you know what the English word for all means? All. You're pretty smart. I see today that the baptism of the Holy Spirit of the message I'm preaching has been reduced in importance for a lot of people seeing it as optional equipment, and their fire is no more than a pile of light to your stove. But God wants to turn that pile of light on and crank it up and add the wind of the Spirit and the gas of the Spirit and fire you up. What do you think is going to happen when you open your mouth? Well, the Bible says, if you ask the Father for a fish, right. will he give you a snake? The answer is no. And when he talked about that parable, he's talking about Jesus and giving us the Holy Spirit. So when you open your mouth and you begin to utter, the Holy Spirit's breathing on that, and you're going to have your fresh new prayer language. I was leading a prayer meeting not too long ago and it was all on the power of the Holy Spirit. And I said, if you want to come, be baptized in the Holy Spirit, come. So we set up worship and things and people came. And uh, this one guy said, I really want the baptism of the Holy Spirit really, really bad. I said, well, today's your day. Four hours later, brother, what happened? Nothing. You never open your mouth? Never. I said, the Holy Spirit's not going to reach in with his hand and rip out your tongue and wave in the air and throw it back. <laughs> it's not the way it works. My, one of my first sermons when I was 15 years old, I started preaching at a convalescent home in Long Beach. 
And nice thing about a convalescent home for elderly people older than me is that when they assembled in the room, half of the room didn't know why they were there and didn't, know, didn't care. And the other half of the room was so excited to see anybody under 40 that I could say anything I wanted, they would love it. <laughs> so, so no matter what I preached and how I preached, they loved it, and I loved it, and I was growing, and I made mistakes, and we had a good time. Sunday after Sunday. Well, this one Sunday I was preaching on the baptism of the Holy Spirit and laying on of hands, and I said, this is how the Holy Spirit comes. And this little old man in his 90s in a wheelchair says, that's not right, brother. I said, tell me, sir. He says, I'm a Pentecostal preacher, and back in the 20s, I was having God, time with God in my own closet, and he brought down his spirit so heavily. I was speaking in tongues, and he gave his testimony in there. And I thought, wow, this was powerful. Now, he's talking about a day in the age in the 1920s, when revival in America started with Zusa Street Revival from 1906 to 1909. And then after that, the 70s of God started in 1914, 1923, Four Square Church, and the Pentecostals just started to, uh, to heat up. But in that day, if you told somebody you spoke in tongues, you paid for it. Yeah, You're of the devil. You, you might even lose your job, or some, somebody might call 911, whatever that was. But you paid for that. So, he, so in those days, when you were baptized the Holy Spirit, you had to want it bad, and you had to stand up for it at the same time. And I think indifference in our day and age is not killing Pentecost, but certainly making it difficult for people to really want to enter in because in a lot of people's minds, it's just not that important. And if it's not important, you will not seek it. If it's not for you and you want to give up on that idea, you know, some people say, you know what, Pastor Mike, I've been around you for a while. I'm just not Pentecostal, okay? I said, well, that is a door slam. I understand what you're saying now. You're saying that I'm evangelical, and I've understood that I divided, put the sand, drew the line in the sand, and now I'm officially non-Pentecostal. You hear me. Well, I said... You have given up on one of the most precious gifts that God wants to give you. You've given up. I pray that you do not give up today. Well, I want to share a testimony that uh, came through my Facebook page this week from a good friend of mine from the 70s named Mark Bellinger. And I didn't know this story before this week, but the story really blessed me. He says, in the 70s, I used to go to Pastor Mike's Bible study. We were both five years old then, laugh, laugh, laugh. He had taught much about speaking in tongues and brought a question to my mind because the pastor where I was going to church preached that tongues had ceased. So I set up with a meeting with Pastor Mike and my pastor to watch a personal debate between the two on the subject. The conclusion for me that day was tongues still exist today. 
Then I started having people lay hands on me and pray for me to speak in tongues many, many times, but nothing happened. I got tired of doing that. One day I just prayed, Lord, I want anything you, that you have. Please give this to me. I leave it in your hands. About 10 days later, at 3 in the morning, I was awakened by myself speaking in tongues. I was shocked. I sat up on the edge of my bed for the next 20 minutes. My mouth just kept on speaking in tongues. And the brain just keeps see, seeing these words come out of my mouth. Wow. All debates were settled for me that day in just 20 minutes. That's me in the 70s. I, th I got a testimony. I thought, oh, thank God. You know, it's always good to get testimonies and things of God doing something. Have you heard? Where's your, where's your heart? Where's your heart? If your heart's ready to receive, you'll receive. If we got the fullest hearts here, if you, you say, you know, my heart's a five-gallon bucket and it's overflowing, you're ready to get a 10-gallon bucket today. Amen. Where's your heart? You want more? If you want the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and I say clearly as a Pentecostal, with the evidence of speaking in tongues, it might be accompanied with other things. Somebody said, well, what about going out in the Spirit? I thought, well, you could get this. Can you imagine being in the upper room with the wind and tongues of fire coming upon you, and you're standing like a stoic Norwegian like this? <laughs> Can you imagine that? Oh, uh, brother, how did you do it? Oh, powerful. <laughs> Wouldn't you imagine if some of them fell over? Wouldn't you imagine if some were screaming and crying and, and praising God? Wouldn't you imagine if some were prophesying and some were right. doing word of knowledge, word of, word of wisdom? Wouldn't you imagine that that room is crazy? Like a bunch of drunken fools, 120 of them. They come down 9 o'clock in the morning and they say, oh, we, we heard what happened. We heard you. You must be drunk. Peter says, it's only 9 o'clock in the morning. Another interpretation, we're just getting started. Can you imagine? Now, but if it was a Nor Norwegian or Swedish Pentecostal service, I think that that's probably all you're going to get. I mean. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, let whatever happens, happen. Some of you need to be kicked into next week. I mean, God, God can do miraculous things with you and through you. Number one, don't care who, what anybody thinks. Yeah. Right. Just let God do what God does. That's right. Come on. And let him have his effect on you. They say, well, that's emotionalism. Sure is. I cry all the time. Yeah. If God's not in charge of my emotions, he is also the creator of my emotions. And we're going to let him have his way. Shout and dance. You can say, well, yeah, I don't mind the dancing. I just got a Pentecost, Pentecost leg on here and a Presbyterian leg on here. <laughs> Keeps me anchored to the ground. What do you care what people think more than God? Yeah. Amen. Right. Amen. 
Okay, stand with me. Is the worship team available? Yes, yes. Okay. Just come and do something. <laughs> Here's what's going to happen. Those of you that Pastor John talked to earlier and said if you got ministry calling, you speak in tongues, you believe in all this, you want to pray for people, come and be here with me and face that way. Is that it? We gotta we gotta set this place on fire. Is this it? This is no. Well, we got more. We got more fired fired up people. Oh, fired up people. You want fired up people too? Fired up people. Fire, fired up people too. Okay. Thank you, fired up person. I know she's fired up. We're, love this girl. Oh, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Okay. We're going to worship the Lord. And I want you to start speaking in tongues. I worship the Lord. And we're going to start off with this group first. Mike, come up here. What are you doing out there? Come on. We're going to worship. Everybody speak in tongues. Now, while, the, while they're getting warmed up, I'm going to tell you, they're getting ready for you. And if you want more of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you want to, and you want to speak in tongues, God's got them ready for you. If you want more of anything, God's got them ready for you. So let's worship the Lord. Speak in the Spirit. Heavenly the Spirit. Heavenly Spirit. God's here to use you. And I stand in. Be ready. I want to see your glory like Moses did. Flashes of light and rolls of thunder. I'm not afraid. No, I'm not afraid.
and let him do it. Show me your glory. The word of the Lord would come to you. You have suffered from anxiety has attacked your physical body and I the Lord want to set you free from that today I want to minister to you says the Lord I've seen you in times of anxiety and trouble and I'm here to rescue you says the Lord and I've come to deliver you and you will be set free Lord thank you for your word today in Jesus name if that's for you come and we're going to anoint you today. The word of the Lord will also come to you and say, if you're considering moving, make sure you're not fleeing from something I want to do. If you're considering moving, make sure you're going towards something I'm directing you to do. I've put in your hands my word, says the Lord, my spirit within you. Make sure that the discernment is in your path, says the Lord. If that ministers to somebody, please come as well. I'm the Lord that heals you, says the Lord. I'm Jehovah Rapha. Put your confidence and faith in me, then I will do it. I've come to heal you today, says the Lord. And I will not disappoint you. I pray, Lord, that you would drop that rhema word in the heart of someone that needs healing today. And if that's you, please come or turn around or whatever. The Lord has heard your cry also about a family member that you're concerned about. You're worried about this family member. And you've been crying out to the Lord for their release, their salvation, their deliverance. And the Lord is taking care of the situation even as you speak. The Lord wants to tell you, I am taking care of that person. I will not fail to answer, says the Lord. If that's for you, please come. The Lord wants to meet you. Get back to that song. Show me your glory. Oh, show me your glory. Show me your glory. Show me your glory. Lord, heal him today right now in Jesus' name. I long to look on the face of the one that I love. Lord, to stay in your presence. Don't worry. Where I belong. Lord, to look on the face of the one that I love. Lord, to stay.
the Lord always grants the prayer of his will. If you're hungry and thirsty for more of God, the Lord's answer is yes. He's going to do that. So if he's going to do that, then you're on the receiving end. So the receiving end is for you to lift up your hands. And we're going to pray that the Holy Spirit falls on you in power. The answer is already yes. So let's bring the music together. And I'm going to start speaking in tongues. I want you just to release and cover the fullness of power. Out of the sheep, out of the sons of the sea. Sons of the sea, out of the Open your mouth, Lord, do it, says the Lord. To be a servant, to be Open your mouth, Lord, do it, says the Lord.
those that are praying they can still pray okay because just like pastor mike was saying some will prophesy and that does occur okay so we're going to let them continue those of you that are here right now guys we just we just got to hear some good words of encouragement before i close i want to give you the ironic blessing Yevareka ka Adonai wish mereka. Yair Adonai penau elika weunika. Yasa Adonai penau elika wesem lekash shalom. The Lord bless you 
and keep you. Lord, make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. We receive that. Amen. Amen. So in closing, guys, normally we do an offering for our guest speakers. We're going to postpone that till next week. So you get a week to pray about what you want to give. Okay. A couple of things I just want to say in closing, and that is this. There's a lot of teaching that comes about the Holy Spirit. And not always is it good. That's why I love that he brought out what he said about uh, Acts 19. Have you heard? Because there's lots of things that are not good about what people say about the Holy Spirit. And what he brought was good. The Holy Spirit wants to fill everyone. Just like God wants everyone saved. Most people don't doubt that. But some people first, unfortunately think that not everyone is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. But that isn't true. God wants everyone saved. And he wants them all filled with power. Amen? So I wanted to extend this invitation in closing that if you want to talk to someone here at the end of service, or anytime for that matter, but specifically right now, if you want to talk to Pastor Mike, Pastor John, there are people available. If you have any other questions, concerns, or want more prayer, we are available for that. Amen? So close your eyes with me one last time. Lord Jesus, help us get our brains out of the way. The bad teaching out of the way and let the good that came this morning soak in. Seed in good soil that will bear fruit of the Holy Spirit. Good soil. Close down the mind, the world that speaks loud but listening just to you, God. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you speak to us and you have a job to do inside of us. And that one thing is bring power. First thing that you bring is power. So, Father, we receive your gifts that you give freely. You're not a respecter of persons. Freely. Thank you, Jesus. So we're going to close and let's sing this one last time. Amen. Show me your glory.